it off. Uh, I was going to introduce everybody, but that, that already happened. Uh, that's a photo. Um, so, real quick, I just want to start with like a real simple survey. First things first, how many people know what Gutenberg is and have actually used it before? How many people have actually used Gutenberg? Look at the way. Okay. Next question. <laughs> How many people think that Gutenberg is the greatest idea in the history of ideas? <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many people think Gutenberg is the worst thing in the history of the internet? Because if you've been on some forums, it's been a bit controversial. Uh, torches and pitchforks have been put together, things like that. Okay, so we're, uh, does that mean, I think I'm getting a vibe reading the room, that we're all kind of in the middle about Gutenberg, that sounds pretty, pretty fair? Okay, cool. So, having started that off, I'm going to moderate today, so I just want to start off with a nice, simple, easy question for you guys. What do you think is the best part about Gutenberg? Who wants to start? Kelly wants to start. I can feel it. Right. Um, I think the best part is a true uh, WYSIWYG, or what you see with what you get, uh, editing experience in, in WordPress. You know, many of you um, build or work with WordPress sites, you're probably used to using, I mentioned this when I talked to you, but you're probably used to using like advanced custom fields, or CMB2, or pink list, or a number of like uh, plugins that just give you fields to fill out, and then in your mind, you're kind of, you know, envisioning like what it will look like on the front end when it gets is rendered there, but in the back end, all you're seeing is the fields that you're filling out. You're not getting a sense of like what it actually looks like. You know, um, so Gutenberg, the, the big advantage in my eyes is uh, for developers to create a, a true like WYSIWYG experience and give people a live preview of what that thing will look like on the front end as they're typing in it, and as they're choosing images, and as they're modifying it. It just gets you know, live updated to reflect those changes, and then they can. Say, knowing that now I go to the front end, it'll look like exactly how I set it up. You know, it's just a just a nicer editing experience overall. And it'll help WordPress stay competitive with you know other platforms that um, are you know putting a lot of work into a lot of emphasis on the, the editing experience. I would say I have two different parts, but they're all the same. It's the, the fluid and seamless experience that it creates. A lot of care has been put into the development side of things, building up components and making a cohesive UI. Um, most of the admin experience stuff in WordPress feels kind of half-baked. Like it's, it's built perfectly for serving WordPress core, but us as developers trying to add to it, we have to bring in all of our stuff. We want a settings page? Perfect. We have functionality for that. But you have to figure out how to build a UI. Oh, you want to create that stuff? Perfect, you have functionality for that, but you have to do all the work and build your own UI. And with Gutenberg, everything is just there. So you can say, well, I need a button, I need this, I need an editor, I need, you know, left and right to play. All of it is standardized. So as tons of plugin developers bring in their own stuff, the experience for the person who owns the site is going to feel pretty seamless because all of these blocks should come together and be very familiar to you. And us developers, don't have to read the wheel like they're making it, which makes for a very fluid editing experience because we just start typing. And lots of care has also been put into the shortcuts that you can use to go from writing another paragraph to another paragraph to now making the whole list. You don't have to take your fingers off the keyboard, which I like. Since I'm also at the table, I'm going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> first of all, it's, it's distracting. It's all out the window. There's people in the hall. Back on Gutenberg, um, I really think that it's about empowerment, uh, and I think that Gutenberg is not only empowering users to not edit their own content, and like you said, like a, a wizzy way that actually displays that, uh, but also it's empowering developers because it's giving us a platform to jump in, and even in some of your live demos, making like your own recent post plugin, or your own call to action plugin, you can build it once and pull that code into somewhere else, and you start to kind of snowball this toolkit over time. And it's not just you yourself building these things from scratch. I think we're going to see a lot more just components that are available for Gutenberg that you can then pick and choose to build things 
more frankly, and I'm more focused on the kind of details of the functionality rather than uh, kind of, okay, time to build my fourth CTA plugin or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I think it's, it's giving everyone this platform to build not only for yourself, but for a community and for a candidate to give thanks to you. Uh, I think it's going to be really exciting uh, whether it ends up in the core or not to build upon in a standardized way and, and kind of extend the not only extra life of WordPress, but just extra life back to where they build cool things. I have been building uh, Gutenberg in quite a lot that you guys have. Like for me, it's a site thing, it is the standards. Um, I don't want to like beat up on like visual page builders to say they're an important part of the WordPress community. But if you ever tried to go from like Divi to Beaver Builder, Beaver Builder it's the way just, around. Yeah, forget it. You're, you have to do the whole site basically all over again. With Gutenberg now, so you build one of these page builders, or just you think of the box and you create, you have a nice, seamless, smooth transition going from one type of site to another. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Like building on that uh, page builder, you said it was a really intricate part. For a long time, there's a lot of different ones out there, and there's a lot of sites that use them. Um, they're built into a lot of useful things and things like that. There's just all across the board. Um, how will a website that's already interacting with page builders react to having this new uh, editor? So just so, just so that you can hear in the back, I just want to iterate your question. Because a lot of sites are built in these, these builders. Some of us inherit them and now have to kind of support it. Others have been building them from the start. There's a, there's a camp of things. At least from what I've seen, there's something that I think the WordPress core team is taking into account. Is that there's not only the Gutenberg experience, but there's also a plugin that I forget what it's called, like Google Editor or something like that, where you can keep those sites in the classic format without using uh, Gutenberg, so that way those don't break. Uh, but I think earlier we were saying that uh, there's this trend, this transformation where a lot of these builders are now going going Gutenberg and and looking to build for that feature where they can all be in one ecosystem. So I think there's a stopgap for the one sites that are already built that way. And then as time goes on, there still be a, will be a place for everybody. Yeah. It's, it's a very awkward time, as talking about this somebody just earlier today, where like, you want to build for Gutenberg now, but Gutenberg is still this sort of moving target. It's, it's mostly well formed, but it's not completely done. And it's a gamble to say, like, oh, I'm just going gonna, gonna to build for this now. And then oh, we have to rebuild the site in a few more weeks because a bunch of stuff has changed. Ideally not, but it's possible. But that's also true if you don't build with Gutenberg in mind right now. You're going to build for whatever tools you have right now, and then in a few months, oh, well, now everybody wants to use Gutenberg, and these two things don't really mesh perfectly. They, they are meshing well because all the page builders out there are like, oh no, our core market's going to disappear because now WordPress core can do some of the things that we've been promising. And I think what we're going to see is them bringing the, the unique benefits that they have into Google. Beaver Builder is a page builder that I like a lot. They focus a lot of energy on converting, they call them modules, into blocks. Um, and they do a lot of things in Beaver Builder that I like for saving modules for reuse, saving a, a row of content, a column of content. Uh, that they've helped bring to Gutenberg. So Gutenberg does have like saved modules, save, sorry, saved blocks that you can reuse quickly and essentially you know, templating what you're doing. I think the page builders are going to bring that into Gutenberg in a really nice way. And so you will be locked into saying, like, well, this was a Divi site, it's always going to be a Divi site. Well, this uses some things from Divi and it uses some things from something else and some things from Google WordPress. It's super maintaining. Right. It, it should be more maintainable going forward is the goal. I believe I saw another hand raised in the back. Oh, yeah, got me flying. Oh, okay. So kind of in the opposite of my first question, what do you think is the biggest weakness we have with Gutenberg right now? At the moment, it, um, it doesn't support some kind of like, fundamental thing, in my opinion. Like, it's, uh, it's some of the blocks you can't have, have text and insert an inline image. There's no support for that right now. Um, and the, the two column block, for, for instance, at this point it's labeled really experimental. We're still working on it. So, to Brian's point, like, I wouldn't launch a site um, on Gutenberg right now to 
you might have users that, that are frustrated by those things, or like, I want some type of inline image. I could do that with the old editor. Why can't I anymore, right? But uh, I think those will, you know, those are on their list, I'm sure, the um, developers of Gutenberg to be ironed out and addressed pretty soon. Um, so that's one weakness right now, just from like a usability standpoint, like right at this moment. From a development standpoint, in my opinion, the, I don't know if I would call it a weakness, but just more of a hurdle is um, a lot of a lot of WordPress developers, I think, are used to the good old days where it's like you have your PHP files, then your CSS files, your JavaScript files, that's it. And those three are all you need to maintain um, to you know send that code to the little PHP code on the back end to generate a markup, and then the CSS and JS might modify it once it gets to the front end, but that's it, you have to worry about those three things, right? Now with this modern tooling though, it's like I feel like they're gonna hurdle hurdle for a lot of people. That bit of the stuff, you know, they'll um, they'll look into like uh, JavaScript's ES6, where it's next syntax, and then React, how that works, and then Redux, which Gutenberg used for state management, which they might not need to dive into it a ton, but maybe to some degree. And then JSX, the syntax that React uses, and then you know, configure things about that and Babel, and so many like things that they think it's more of a more of a barrier, more of a barrier that's super easy. No, I'm just saying. I think, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one with the tool I demo, like anything you make it more easy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, just picking back up what I think that there's going to be so another obstacle that is in, in Gutenberg's path is that for the longest time it's been coming and it's still coming. But a lot of developers are like, okay, I've got too much going on. Let me know when you're ready. I'll be back. And like, so there's going to be developers that now, once it launches, uh, fully, that now are just starting out of the gate and have to kind of pick up speed and catch pace. There's, there's also the ones that have been with it throughout the whole the middle. Uh, so I think there's, there's going to be, for a bit, just a wide kind of array of people and skill sets and, and, and knowledge bases. And I think that one thing the WordPress community has always done is kind of rally together. So I think that this, to that effect, of, I have to read, read, read Webpack, React, Redux, all these other things. Um, I think there'll be things that make them, things easier for, for people like Google. Just in your talk, like the app that was made to create a, a Gutenberg block. I, I think we're going to see more tooling and more things to ease that friction, because that's what the community is always about. No, that's perfect. Um, I think the biggest weakness is that it still doesn't write my content for me. I would like it to do that. <laughs> that's the hardest part, is, is coming up with the content. Uh, also, it still has a few accessibility challenges. Or rather, it introduced a ton of accessibility problems, but they're actively being worked on, which is awesome. So I think ultimately it is going to be one of the more accessible web interfaces for creating content. But at the moment, since it's still being built, it poses a ton of problems for people who are using assistive tech. But over time, that would be a problem that would be amazing. One of the concerns I've had is even outside of just the WordPress community, just like talk about JavaScript, for example, there's huge debates about CSS and JavaScript and combining those things with components and things like that. And now what we're doing is we're taking all those problems that are outside of WordPress and we're pulling them all in the grades and holding a uh so if you guys had a position on that. We ran into things to argue about. We need more things. I'm still out on semicolons. <laughs> Never again, no. Um, I can I can do about that. I think that there's a, a standard and like a recommendation um, to some degree, but there's also it's not also safe to come from CSS have action to be success. Like we still all work in. So I think that they're trying to give everyone the tools to do things in a modern way, but things change over time. How we do it now. We could see Google launch and then instead of React it's beautiful or something else snap it or something that's not built yet. Um, so, I think there's always going to be a state of flux, but we're going to always kind of going to hey, here's what we think is best, and you do however you want to do it, and that's the one point. Yeah. I, I'm of the camp of writing things in the way that's most convenient, so I kind of like being able to kind of co-mingle my styling and my templating and my JavaScript. Um, not all together, because that's difficult to maintain, but the fact that in a single file I could write a little bit of CSS and in a different spot I could write a little bit of templating and in a different spot I could write a little bit of logic, 
it's nice having it all in one spot to look at instead of opening up this file and opening up that file and opening up that file. And then having the build tool pull out their own fits. Like, okay, all the styling goes into this style sheet, all the JavaScript goes into this JavaScript file, all the templating is what gets right in the front end. I kind of like that. Um, I haven't fully embraced it yet. I have this love-hate relationship with build tools. Like I like that they exist and can do a lot of things for me, but I hate, like, okay, before I can start my project, I have to make sure that these 10 things are all lined up. Okay. Part of me still likes just playing with the little JavaScript and CSS. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, clearly, like, one of the biggest problems is I a lot of like a developer at my level has is I just barely like really rocking PHP and now I've had this huge shift happening in towards JavaScript and all this stuff. Do you think that it might be the uh Gutenberg's opportunity for a developer like myself to start taking the skill of and applying in WordPress to carry it over, or do you think that the skill that you learn here are going to be kind of limited to just WordPress? In Word, yes. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll continue with this and I'll let you guys talk. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity. I've been thinking about this a lot. There, there have been arguments like, oh, well, now that everything's moving to JavaScript, it's going to be so much harder for people to contribute to WordPress because now they have to learn so many more things. And I think in the reality, it's just yeah, new people are going to learn different things. So when I was, like, I learned PHP courtesy of learning to build inside of WordPress. Especially when they came on CSS and they're like, oh, this WordPress thing looks pretty cool. Oh, this is what PHP is? So you just call this thing with this name and that's a function. I got you. Um, and so people jumping in now are going to learn JavaScript first instead of PHP first. Um, so the people who have the most to learn are us who are already in, entrenched, who are now learning another way of doing things. But a lot of that knowledge is transferable, which is nice. So it's, it's basically just learning some new syntax and learning some new tools, which is, it, it is a big undertaking, but it's not an insurmountable one. And the nice thing about this, like you just asked, this knowledge is transferable outside of WordPress. So you can start learning to do stuff with these fancy JavaScript things, which is what's happening largely outside of WordPress in largely the same way. Yeah. I would say, um, yeah, it's absolutely applicable. You know, for anybody, anybody who is uh, doing learning development, you know, I would say like, look, Concepts are more important than like getting a particular thing to work at any given time, right? If you, in general, if you know that like if you if you under, understand and, and use like um, san sanity checks for for things in your code, and you escape things that you output it, you sanitize it, you save it to the database, I mean, you, all those kinds of best practices. Like I think if you learn them in PHP and then move JavaScript or you know whatever other, insert other language here, like all those concepts still apply, right? It's like Brian was saying, it's more just like getting used to this new syntax and this new way of doing things in that language. And it might have some, you know, quirks to it that the language you're used to might not. They're not one-to-one, -one, you know, uh, comparison, of course, because they are different. But uh, I think if you, like, nail those fundamentals in any language, then all of that is true. He's got a JavaScript course and React course. And he makes us a great course. Yeah, a great course is awesome. 
uh, Zach Gordon's Gutenberg course that I mentioned at the end of my session. If you go to Gutenberg.courses, there are actually two different courses. There's one by my friend Joe Casabona that's all about using and working with Gutenberg, which is perfect to figure out like all the cool things that Gutenberg itself can do from like uh, end user perspective. Which is also really good to share with clients. Like, here's all the stuff that you're going to want to know about this new editor. Um, but then Zach Gordon's course is all about development, and he takes it from the very beginning. He's like, all right, we're going to start with some basic JavaScript. We're going to set up Webpack. We're going to get everything just running, basically. And now we're ready to build a block. We're going to build these 10 different blocks, blocks through from very simple to very complex, very easy to follow along with. Um, Hi, yes, a comment and a question. Your comment is, could you repeat the question? Oh, yes, okay. I forgot to do that. Uh, the question is, everybody's encouraged to take a mobile-first approach to websites, okay? Does this, uh, what you see is what you get in Gutenberg, contribute to that and therefore save development time? Or is it pretty much uh, what you see is what you get on a you know, on your big Mac? That's a good question. I'm going to fit into that for a second, because I think you two had something to add. The question that I was answering that I forgot to repeat is, where are good places to go to learn all of this new stuff that we're going to have to start figuring out pretty soon? The Gutenberg and like, the Reacts and everything else. Yeah, and everywhere else. Did you have something to add to that? Sure. Yeah. So I think another thing to your point, like, does all this stuff, like, do I need to learn React to get Gutenberg? I think at first when you dive into it, and maybe I don't know if you read your face stuff. It was awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think as you start to get into the code, there's going to be like, wait a second, what's that? Uh, and but then you start to like look at it, and it starts to slowly kind of come together. Right? More tutorials, whether it's a course on YouTube or just digging into the code, whatever your style is, um, it'll start to just you just oh okay, I just do that. But if you want to take it further, and you'll start to learn like. Oh, React. This is just React. Like, there's there's things that start to connect. So it just depends on can you get away with just it's magic and it just works, or do you need to get in with the gears and, and find out what's going on? So I think there's a spectrum. Like, you'll be able to survive without learning React. Yeah. So and but I, I think if you are adventurous and you jump into React, it will just solidify what you know and what you really want. Um, I would say, so what's boss, I would echo what those guys said. I think several of these courses are like all really well done. Another one is Steven Greider, um, has courses on Unity. They are super cheap. I took a, one of his React, two of his React courses, each one I paid like $13. Well, that's okay. a rip off, wait until they're 10 up. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? I got the first for 13 and then at the end of it is like, did you like this? Here are coupon codes for money off. Don't ever pay more than $13. For, so the next one I got to like, what was the instructor's name? Steven, it's with a PH, S T E P H E N Grider, G R I D E N. G R I D E N. He teaches at Udemy, U D E M Y dot com. His are really good though. He has, he has like React, you know, basic fundamentals and then an advanced one. They can both of his. Both of them are just like, um, it's like if you were sat down with somebody else and, they, and, they, and you guys have like, can you show me start to finish how to build a simple React app? Anything I would, everything I would need to do. He just does that a couple times in a row. You're like, here's the first one, it's pretty simplistic. Start to finish, here's how to do it. Once you master that, the second one's a little more complex. Start to finish. Here's the third, and like by the end of the course, you've built three things, and you have the second and third build on uh, the skills you learned in the first one. His are really good. Um, no kind of points of intervention. Yeah, I'm going to response. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, Has anybody good. actually opened the Gutenberg editor on a phone yet? Because I have it. Wait, no, I only use phones for development. Okay. Sorry, I want to add one more, one more thing I almost forgot. Um, that is, I would push back a little bit on the, the idea that um, you don't really have to be familiar with React to work with Gutenberg. The more I dig into it, I find that like in React, there's a difference between uh, what's called a stateless functional component, where it just takes in some props and renders something out. And then there's something called a stateful component where it has an internal state that it keeps. I think if you're um, if you're making pretty simplistic blocks that are just that stateless functional component way, then it's absolutely true you don't really need to, need to understand how React works. You can just in Gutenberg you can say, okay, edit 
function does this, or my save function does this. If you're if you're building more complex blocks where they need to keep track of their internal state, um, I would say you really need to know React because you can extend these components and then to create the state object that you update at different points in the um, in you know when the user is clicking around and you're interacting, you update that that state using React um, methods for doing that, like that set state. You really have to be familiar with that and update the internal state of that component. Um, and also lifecycle methods too. If you're digging into core Gutenberg, you will notice some of their blocks they've written use these functions like component will receive props, component will mount, component did mount. If you don't know what React is, you, you, you'll just think like that's an name they came up with. You know, you're a quarter link and um, you won't see that function being called anywhere either. That's the other thing. You just have to know. If you know a little bit about React, though, you know that, oh, well, um, a component did now, that's the thing that React calls automatically whenever a, a component did now did, you know, and it's it about it is being displayed. So things like that. I would, I would just say, like, the more you dig into it, the more that would be a requirement to understand, like, the lifecycle method, method, when you see them, what those are actually doing. And then how to in, update uh, the state inside of the component. And some of you, like, if that sounds over your head, over your head, you're like, I don't even know what what internal state even means. You know, um, I would say like, don't start there. Start with more simple, super blocks, and then if there's a need, you keep track of that, then get to it. So like my, for anybody who was in my talk earlier, um, the second block, the dynamic one, that had some internal state state to it. So you can take a look at that for a simple example. Track of like what the last you know uh, last interactions were, and then it renders a different thing in OpenSAM depending on the new like, internal state what it's been set to. So the next question I was I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry with with mobile being such a big part of what we do, and mobile first being the mentality that we've been sort of striving towards these last few years. How does Gutenberg facilitate? Uh, mobile layouts. You want to take that one? Just throw me over Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think I think there's also just something to think about now is where Gutenberg is today and where it's going. I think very much what I believe is that they're going to keep inching closer and closer to a true what you see, what you get, where the back end and the front end are going to start blurring. And it'll almost be just, I'm logged in and I'm on my site, I can click on a title and just start editing. Like, I think that's what we're going to do. Yeah. So I think with that, you're going to start to see, and if you saw in his talk, because he, he showed us the code, so that's why he grabbed his hand. Um, there is style for the front end and the back end already baked in. So I do believe from what I've seen, what I've experimented with, you can start to put those media queries in those style sheets and start to have your back end react to it based on the screen size. Um, I think that there's still going to be like with that inspector tool and some things that we have to figure out. Like I would never like edit on the back end. Just personal preference. So I think there's something where we make room for use of that extra room we've got on desk, desktop um, that we'll have to figure out if, if we're really going to move to mobile editing. But for content, it's all. It's all. What, one of the things that I've noticed too is like a few months ago, everybody was panicking about meta boxes and Google. How are they going to work? They're going to disappear. The sky is falling. It's just going to be cat, just cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. And then they fixed it. And it was fine. Like you can right. use it now. And so to answer your question, if it's not working on mobile now, it doesn't mean it's never going to work on. For Kellen, you brought up accessibility. Or sorry, Brian, you did. Yeah. It, there's some serious problems with accessibility there. It doesn't mean that Gutenberg is at this state where they're just giving up on it. It's just it's working trying. Yeah. And to continue on your point of eventually front end and back end will be seamless. We'll just be editing what is the front end experience. That experimentation is already happening with Gutenberg. The customizer that started out as the theme customizer, that's now just the entire site experience customizer, has gained a lot of cool tech in the last year. Gutenberg is coming, and the customizer team and the Gutenberg team have been playing with many ideas together so that you're working with Gutenberg and the customizer simultaneously. And it's clunky right now. There's nothing done, but it paints a really Neat looking feature that it's very exciting. I've even uh, recently I've, I've read about some projects on, on GitHub where somebody has um, more for experimentation than anything else has exposed Gutenberg to the front end 
a WordPress site, so they just like where the pane would usually you know be along the right side of the screen. The admin they're showing it there on the front end, making things editable there, which is kind of interesting. Ian, you had a question? Yeah, um, what's the, what are we looking at for like the release of the core for Gutenberg? And are you guys using um, a plugin in any production sites for clients right now? Hell no. <laughs> so the question to, to reiterate from the camera and anybody who's in here what's the projected release date for Gutenberg merging into core? And are any of us using the Gutenberg plugin as is on a production site? Gun, what do you think? Um, nobody knows is the answer number one. They, they were, um, they've been saying WordPress 5.0 is the, uh, what they're striving for. And you all are probably um, familiar with WordPress's like annual themes that they've created for a long time, right? 2013, 2014, 2016. There wasn't one this year, right? Because they a lot of work through putting all their all their effort, all their focus into getting the group work, you know, out the door and right production ready. So that's where all really all the emphasis is right now. But I mean there's still a backlog of like accessibility issues um, to address and things I mentioned about like inline images and column. Wow, so there's like 600 open issues on GitHub. So put it in perspective, like the amount yeah. of total open versus what they've closed and like what's remaining. They've been working their tables on time. Yeah, time. Like, so it sounds like there's a lot. There's been a lot that's kind of done too. So yeah. just, just to their credit. Yeah, so it's, it's not unclear right now. Yeah, I think one of the best parts about this project is it sounds a little scary. It doesn't have a specific deadline because they want to do it when it's ready as opposed to choosing an arbitrary date and kind of rushing it out there. And we're seeing, I, I'm getting a vibe, it's taking a little longer than I think people were planning, but that's okay because we're building it out to meet those standards to have. Yeah. In December, there was a lot of optimism that it could be done by April. And on Tuesday, it will be May, because anybody hasn't looked at a calendar recently. It is not ready yet. Last I heard was they're shooting for this year. So yeah. hopefully this year, but I think the longer that we wait, the better every release it'll be and the bigger less hiccups. And I think that it is such a huge shift in the way that WordPress has worked for so long that they just want to make sure to take the time. But if it's taking too long, it's open source, so help out. Yeah. Is WebDev using it on in production for anybody yet? We're not. No, and intentionally we're not using it right now. For the issue I, issues I mentioned, in like images, columns, whatever else like I think you know, the baseline, uh, the baseline for like whether you should use it right now or not, to me is, is it worse than the current editor in any way? The, the answer is yes. Like, you can't do certain things like inline images that I don't think it's ready yet, right? You, you probably want to make sure you can do all those things before layering on the fancy, you know, fly preview and, and all the benefits that, that comes with. So, yeah, we're not using it right now. Um, if we're getting ready, we just like open source our Block or good word block um, plugin that we plan on using on client projects with some of the basic blocks we think most clients will need, and then on top of that, we'll create like a custom ones that they might need for the project. But yeah, we're doing like all that work right now to kind of get ready for it. It's better than the way we do an open source stuff. We're working internally uh, as well, and we've got some sites that are public facing, but they're not clients that are managing it. So if a site can be simple enough to be just like a band layout where you've got a hero image and then like content and whatnot, and you know, you multiple columns and all this other stuff. But we've done, we've used it already as it is. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that to hear what you're saying, I don't think I would turn it over to a client to use with right now. It's just, it's not the baseline functionality yet. Yeah. I'm not making it into WP sessions in the next couple of months. Right. That's about it. Yeah, well, then the plugin will be able to able to be turned on Uber for post types. Specific that's a good one. So the question is can you enable Gutenberg for specific <laughs> post types? And right now I think that is yes. I think by default it's enabled everywhere, but you can explicitly say don't load Gutenberg for anything except this one post type. Uh, human made is one example uh, they're an agency based out of UK. They rebuilt their own site focusing on Gutenberg and wrote a beautiful blog post detailing some of the challenges 
their site is cryptically hnn.md. So human made with zero vowels. Thank you, sir. I've got like two and a half overview questions. Okay. Um, will Gutenberg be mandatory? Is it the largest overhaul? And if so, why? So is it mandatory? Well, that was a video that we're pressed like, It's an event, and they put the last thing I heard about that kind of situation is that at one point when it gets released, it will be rolled out as the event. But there's a plugin that is like older or something like that. Like, you can install class access. Uh, I'm gonna call it an old time. No, uh, but yeah, that plugin, if installed, shuts down the like, you know, plugin and allows you So I think at that point when it's time to go, there'll be a way to map uh, or a path to like Great. And be, do you have a site that you want to stay pristine and the awesomeness that you built it? If so, install this plugin along with the new update of the firmware press. Otherwise, you could wear it and all of us. I believe is the current plan. Yeah. Uh, and then you said two awesome questions after that. Is this the biggest overhaul ever? Uh, from my recollection, I think the WordPress API and this are so close. Because those two things, like, it's like a toy box now of what we'll be able to do. Uh, my buddy did a talk downstairs, Anthony Alamano, about the WordPress API and how you can actually like don't have your front end be WordPress driven. You can have a React app or have a single like uh, same thing app application that is fueled by WordPress. So you get the coolness and the easy editability of WordPress to control your data. And then you're just funneling that off to some app somewhere else, and that's what the, the customer thinks. So I think that's going to be really cool. Uh, and then Gutenberg right behind it. Uh, now we're able to kind of almost see visually the layouts and have all these tools that the community is available to build it yourself. So I'd say it's up there. And you had a third question that's also super awesome. But what makes the Gutenberg overhaul such a monumental change? I think it's because the, and sorry, you can't the, no, what you get. Yeah, I, okay. I think that is like the biggest takeaway, but I think it's also just like changing how, like, so, Go like sort of all the way back to like the beginning of like we got all these builders that do cool stuff. I personally do things in a certain way. We all build in a certain way. Gutenberg's kind of standardizing that, so in the future we can keep building cool things. Right now everyone's like, oh, I'm either an advanced custom fields guy or I'm this and for the post type data. Then layered on top of that, you've got your visual composer, your beaver. Beaver Builder. Beaver Builder. I don't use that one, so I don't know. Don't go, don't go with that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, but everyone's been doing it a, a different way, right? And so we've got all these people that have really, really strong suits. I, I like the Visual Composer because it's everything's just a bucket of whatever I can drop it all in. Or I like the Deep Builder because it's super good and I use it all the time. I'm very familiar with it. Um, but it's taking all the, their strong suits and then giving them an underlying base to build on. So that whether you switch from this strong area of like customization or this area over here because they've got a really cool like slider carousel thingamabob, all of that now can play on a level playing field and be swapped in the internet. So yes, WYSIWYG thing, but I think there's a lot more to it. And that'll be good. When, when it launches, six months later, it's going to be awesome to be a developer. Yeah. I think the biggest UI change was actually from WordPress 2.5 to 2.6, maybe it was 2.6 to 2.7, where the complete admin interface changed. Mm -hmm. It had a, a horizontal navigation across the top, and then they implemented what was known as the crazy horse layout, which has the navigation down the side, and brought with it many, many wonderful refinements that have been iterated on what we have now, which was awesome. This is the, the single biggest change to the editor, since WordPress was created. It's been a tiny MCE since the beginning, and that has brought with it all of the wonderful challenges that it has had. And now we're getting rid of that to make what should be, as I said, a very fluid editing experience where you just start typing. As you're hitting enter to create a new paragraph, it's putting in new blocks you don't even realize. And you highlight the last few lines you wrote, and you say, I want to be a bold list, and back it, that's going from three separate paragraph blocks to 
one single bullet in this block, you say, oh no, I didn't want to do that, I didn't want to do it. It goes back to being three separate bullets. It's doing lots of really cool stuff behind the scenes. And you don't even have to worry about that. It's just seamless and simple. So that's why I think it's such a big deal. It's so nice. I kind of don't like, to kind of like rephrase what you're saying. Right? I think when you talk about biggest change, REST API was like a huge under the hood change. It opened up the platform a whole bunch of ways. But in terms of ways that like just an average user who doesn't even look at code goes, this is probably the biggest change. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and a few other things uh, I'll speak about as we go. So related to um, sites like uh, being updated to WordPress and the option to use the class class together to plug in and all that kind of stuff. Uh, one thing, important thing to note, I think, is that uh, when Gutenberg drops, it will be a major release, not a point release. So that means, as many of you may know, WordPress now does automatic updates for point releases, but not major releases, right? So you never have to worry about like. My live sites, and when it, you know, when, it, when Uber goes live, it's my site, you know, auto update, it'll just break things, start up, you're ready for it, right? It'll be you, it'll be an intentional action. You don't have to click the update button and intentionally, like, know you're going to 5.0. Um, so just, just be aware of that, I guess. Um, what else do we have? Oh, biggest change. Yeah, what these guys said, or like custom, custom post types comes to mind too, right? Going from post and post pages only to Anything you can see about books and recipes. Was a big one too, I guess, but uh, more of an addition, like he was saying, that are as the rest of the API, yeah, not yeah, the not overall of the pieces. So you can even require as, the, as developers, which I'm not, um, who use, uh, if you use uh, Beaver Builder or Elementor or one of them, do you think that the integration with Gutenberg will result in leaner? Faster loading sites built with these page builders. If, if you're not a developer, you're thinking in like super great. Like your questions are awesome, so thank you. Yeah. What? Your questions are amazing, so thank you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the question was, will this like all of these things moving to Gutenberg lead to faster uh, load times? And I think yes. The, the reason why is because to pull off a lot of that non-core functionality. If you look at like the panel or the console and look what's loading, it's a lot of JavaScript, a lot of style, everything that gets injected like at runtime. Um, so all that kernel can be optimized through the WordPress core, but then also through just the standardized way of things. So I think inevitably, yes, uh, would be my answer. But there's still a chance that someone can go in and, and cause that to not be the case. So it, it should move it in the faster, speedier way. I can't say for everything. Yeah, I'd say that's generally true. There are some layout editors that are already good actors and they compile everything down to HTML and stuff it in the post content. So there is no real time stuff in the page loads and others that aren't. Which brings me back to the fluid point I made earlier. Short codes are how we insert complicated things into our content area now. That's just stupid. Now you just have a block. There it is. You There's my own. Oh, oh, this is the gallery. It looks like it. I mean, I once did a simple picture of text next to a layout and like uh, a builder that I won't name, and then I did the same thing in Gutenberg. And the markup I got out of that simple layout of the builder was insane. I mean, it was just div soup and it was inline style. What happened there? Yeah. Gutenberg was just picture block next to it. It's mean, very, very simple. So uh, I think in that respect, you can definitely help out a lot. Uh, it been brought to my attention that we're running out of time. I want to thank our panelists for contributing a lot of great information here today. Because uh, I have questions, which we can come up and ask any of us afterwards. So if you ask me, I'll make something up. Yes. I'm sure you can talk downstairs. If you like me, come see it. Go see this talk. If you have questions about Kellen and my talk from earlier this morning, find us. We're around all day, and we love talking about this stuff. So find us, corner us, talk to us. We want to answer your questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.